Laura and Pete sat in the departure lounge of Flight 3425 to Bali, holding hands. After all the preparations and preparations, it was nice to finally go through all the formalities. Laura closed her eyes. It was very early after a late night of sex. She needed this vacation. It was going to be a long year. Yes, two weeks of sun and sex. Just what the doctor ordered. Pete let go of her hand to pull his phone out of his pocket when he heard the message tone. That reminds me, Laura, don't forget to put your phone in airplane mode. I didn't bring my phone with me. Pete was distracted, looking at the screen of his phone. Laura was admiring his face when she saw it tense. What's the matter, Pete? Pete nervously handed over the receiver and she read, Peter Auer, just touch that woman and you'll regret it for the rest of your life. God, Pete, you're a fool. You must have warned your wife, she knows. Laura joined Pete, looking around at all the visible faces in the lounge area. Impossible, Laura. I packed everything last night when she was in bed and put the suitcases right in the car. She almost killed me with sex when I finally got to bed, and this morning she kissed me. It can't be her. Must have gotten the wrong number, Pete. No, it mentions my name, see? Maybe it's your husband? Don't be silly. He has no idea. He thinks I'm going on a two-week training course. Besides, how would he know your name and number? We've been incredibly careful. Absolutely no one knows about us. Whose number is it? I don't recognize anyone. I have some zany friends, and I don't think they'd want to play a prank on me. Tell you what, I'll call Penny and you call your husband. See if anything seems out of the ordinary to them. Laura watched Pete press the speed dial number. There was no answer, and he left a message saying that he missed her already. Pete hung up the phone and looked at Laura puzzled. Are you going to call your husband? I didn't bring my phone with me. You can use mine. Laura started to reach for the proffered phone, but then they both realized how stupid it was. For the first time, Laura began to regret the decision. Further conversation was interrupted by the call to board the plane. They stood in line together, but they were no longer comfortable holding hands in public. Laura noticed Pete scanning the passengers looking for familiar faces. Laura was vaguely amused by this. He continued his search as they walked to their seats. They took their assigned seats, and once seated, Laura intertwined her arm with his and rested her head on his shoulder. Why didn't you bring your phone with you, Laura? It's all part of my cunning plan. You'll be proud of me for it. I'll show you once we're in the air. Half an hour later, the plane gained altitude, and Laura pulled her laptop out of her bag. She started it up and went to a Word document. I have invested in our future lover. When my husband goes to bed tonight, he will find a letter from me. If he doesn't agree with what it says, we will lose nothing. And if he does, this trip will just be the beginning of a new life for both of us. Here is a copy. She handed the computer to Pete. My dear husband, I love you and only you and have loved you since we met 25 years ago. I look forward to spending the next 25 years or more with you. It is what I have always wanted and what I still truly desire. I love you more and more each day and have happily devoted my life to taking care of you and our wonderful children. With the exception of some visits to friends, I have asked for almost nothing for myself. I know that you love me and always want me to be happy and satisfied. Since we love each other, I want to propose to you. I have purposely approached it in such a way that you have two whole weeks to think about my idea. If we were to do it face to face, there would be a great danger of you becoming macho to me and saying something that we might not be able to get past. I can't take that risk. It's the same reason I left my phone there so you can't contact me for the entire two weeks. I'm not on a work course and no one there knows where I am, so don't waste your time trying to contact me. Darling, you are a wonderful lover and I never tire of being in your arms. However, I miss arousing sex with other people so much that I risk incurring your wrath by doing what I do. Before you get too angry, just keep things in context. I'm going away for two weeks with a friend from work. I have never been unfaithful to you, and without your full blessing, I never will be. I propose the following. With your blessing, I would like to have sex with other men. I feel that my needs have grown to the point that one man, even one as talented as you, will not be able to fulfill them. It will never be someone you know, and I promise to always be discreet. In fact, I will be so discreet that you won't even know when or where unless you want me to. 
At the slightest hint that anyone we know suspects what I am up to, I will stop immediately. You will always have me whenever you want me, and nothing about that will change. You are my husband, and your needs will always come first. I want you to be assured that this will not change the way I feel about you or our lovemaking together. In short, it will not affect us in any way, shape, or form. Think about it for the next two weeks, please, darling. If you love me as much as you say you do, you will jump at this opportunity to prove it. I know how much you love me, and that knowledge will be with me every time I fall asleep at night while I'm away. So I trust that you will spoil me now. Please, my dear, think about it for the next two weeks. If your answer is no, I will honor your wish and would appreciate the opportunity to talk more. I will try not to take too much offense at the names you call me and your implied lack of trust. If your answer is yes, then all you have to do is say, the answer is yes, and we won't have to talk about it again, though I'd be happy to if you'd like to. Your loving wife, Laura. Pete finished reading and simply said, wow. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? I must confess that I stole many of the words from a story I saw on an erotic fiction site by a guy named Biggie33, who wrote, We need to talk. Why did you call the letter an investment in our future? Don't you see? I asked my husband for permission to have sex outside of marriage. If he agrees, then when we go back, we can move on with our lives without guilt. Laura mentally added, Well, I can go on. Two weeks with you and I'll be sure I don't need you anymore. But your replacement? That's a whole other story. You're so sure he'll agree. Of course. I gave the impression he had a choice, but that's only so he can convince himself he's in control. If he dares to say no, we'll have to keep sneaking around like before. So, how do you like that? Not bad, decisive and logical. However, it's a decision he will never base on logic. I hope he's not a real man, otherwise it's a bit insulting. What? There's no way he was offended by anything in that letter. It took me a few days to get it exactly right. Yes, but you have to realize that you could spend a year and still risk offending him. As a woman, you can never understand how a man's brain works. The main thing I took away from that letter is that he is no longer capable of satisfying you and that no matter how good he is, he never will. You should know, Laura, that every man is a little paranoid about his work. The thought of leaving you for someone else who might be bigger or better only fuels that paranoia. Honestly, Laura, I can only see two reactions to him reading this. One is to give up and give in, and the other is to come out swinging. Well, I think you're wrong. I know my husband. He will appreciate my honesty and seriously consider it. If I ask before I do something, it will be completely risk-free. Pete looked at his future lover and thought how much she believed her own nonsense. He was already seeing her in a new light. Sure, he was bending the truth to get that pass from his wife, but Laura's blatant lies and manipulation of her husband were alarming. Part genuine curiosity and part devilishness drove him to his next question. How did the big guy story turn out for Laura? Did the lady get to drink all she could? He got his answer long before she opened her mouth. Her face suddenly became very serious. No, her husband kicked her out. To distract her from her doubts about whether she was doing the right thing, Peter changed the subject. After all the effort and expense of this trip, the last thing he wanted was for her to wake up and actually do what the letter said. An innocent vacation. I didn't tell you about the weirdo I saw at international registration, did I? He was standing about 25 meters away from me while I was in line. When he saw me looking at him, he just stared at me and ran his index finger down my throat in a slashing motion. I looked around to see if he was doing it to someone behind me, but there was no one. It was creepy. Laura asked nonchalantly. Yes, what did he look like? The world is full of strange, troubled people. That's the thing, Laura. He looked like a regular guy. Over six feet, dark hair, goatee. Peter stopped when Laura suddenly sat up straight and started up her laptop again. Starting it up, she opened several files. She pulled up a picture of herself and a man standing in front of the house. In a voice trembling with worry, she asked, Is that him? It, it could be, Laura. It certainly looks a lot like him. But I can't be sure. Laura looked intently at Peter. Did he have an incentive to lie to her? Was he afraid that if she was sure her husband had figured out their game, she would become unavailable to him for the next fortnight? For the first time, it occurred to Laura that Peter was a man who was willing to cheat on his wife 
and therefore fundamentally untrustworthy. What was that guy wearing, Pete? That's another female issue, Laura. Guys don't notice what other guys are wearing. Didn't you say he dropped you off at the domestic terminal? Yeah, that's him. I convinced him to just drop me off and leave. When I saw him leaving, I took the bus to the international terminal. So he'd have to go back to his car, drive to the international terminal and park, and then find out who to chase in the check-in line. Pretty unlikely, Laura. I think it's more likely that it was just a random psycho. He knew he had to distract Laura, who looked far from convinced. Is that your house in the picture, Laura? Laura, who also wanted a distraction and was used to people complimenting her about her house, went on autopilot. Yes, it is. It's nice, isn't it? We bought a plot on the beach as an investment. It's very steep and narrow. You wouldn't believe the house is collapsible, would you? It took my husband 15 years, but he kept adding on and on to it and landscaping around it. You should see the inside of it. He is an artist and each room has murals with a theme. Nautical theme in the bathrooms and living room. Business theme in the study. You walk into the study and the atmosphere says work, and you work. I'm not going to tell you what the theme is in the bedroom. We've won all kinds of awards for the interior design and the way the house utilizes the land. There's even a creek running under the house. The conversation turned to the topic of their families, which they had so far skirted in their relationship. They talked about Pete's two children, ages six and eight. Laura talked about her three. Sarah, a 23-year-old who had just graduated from law school and was working as a real estate lawyer and her two children still at home, Daniel, 16, and Larry, 13. Laura didn't know it, but she tried desperately to distract herself. For a while, she succeeded. Then she pulled out a notepad and wrote, Lawyer, Home, and Children. Not knowing if her husband was following her, she couldn't make any plans for him. She knew she had to back herself up by protecting the house and family. After the couple fell silent, Laura began to berate herself for being a coward and not thinking about her position or the possible situation. She pieced together the chronology of events. She had packed on Thursday night, being careful not to include anything non-business or unwarranted to wear on the weekend between the two weekly courses. Bikinis and intimate apparel she planned to buy in Bali. That evening, her husband behaved perfectly normally and they made love. On Friday, she went to work at her normal time. They wanted to do some serious work on her company car, so she arranged for her husband to pick her up on Friday afternoon. He went into the reception area, waited for her to pack up, and drove her home. They had lunch with the kids, drove them to their grandparents' house, and then made love until late at night. She was especially horny in anticipation of the next night and because of her husband's ignorance. Saturday morning, an early rise, a trip to the airport. Laura remembered how nervous she'd been when she'd suggested her husband just take her bags to the check-in line and leave them. Other times he stayed until the plane took off. She was relieved when he immediately agreed. She'd watched him all the way to the parking lot and then waited for his car to pull away. Now his impatience to leave took on a darker meaning. She compared his behavior last night and today to her careful planning. Hell, no one from her job knew anything except that she'd taken annual leave, and her husband didn't know anyone from her job at all. He had no way of knowing what she was planning. The text message that came to Pete's phone was a prank call from a friend. The guy staring at him in the check-in area was a random psycho. Relax, Laura. What would be the consequences if he found out? She'd lied to him about her destination, so what? The letter said she was traveling with a friend from work, but didn't specify if it was a man or a woman. She didn't realize she'd closed her eyes until they opened. She imagined her husband knowing her final destination at the airport and realized how it would look to him. The deception would have to look like she had slipped away precisely to hide. That in itself was serious, but with some skill it could be defended. Combined with the contents of the letter, however, it was not in the slightest doubt. Laura used the rest of the flight to cover whatever she could. The first priority was to destroy the letter lying under a pillow 2,500 kilometers from her ass. The second priority was to convince herself that she was worrying too much about nothing. Laura, always ready to anticipate every contingency, wrote a long letter to Sarah, knowing she couldn't send it before Bali. In it, she begged her daughter to go to her house and do two things. The first was to take possession of her phone and switch it to Pete's number. She reasoned that she was embarrassed to tell anyone that she had forgotten it, and she had bought a prepaid phone for the trip. The second task was to retrieve the letter from under her father's pillow. 
she begged not to read it as it was deeply personal, written between husband and wife. Mother and daughter were very close, so she knew she could trust her to not only follow the instructions, but to be discreet about it. As an addendum, Laura asked Sarah to acknowledge receipt of the letter and to further notify her that she had done what she had been asked to do. As soon as Pete and Laura got off the plane at Denpasar Airport, Laura sent an email and then, figuring her husband wouldn't check the caller ID, called him from Pete's phone. None of her calls were answered then or during the hour it took to get through customs and get to their hotel. This had never happened before, and alarm bells were ringing in her head. Just before the cab pulled up to the hotel, Sarah called Pete's phone and confirmed that she had done as requested. Laura managed to dodge a few questions about what was going on. When Sarah asked if her father was okay, her answer horrified her mother. Her father had called to say that he had some things to think about and that he was taking the other children to his cabin in the country. Sarah was going to join them that evening. Laura asked her husband what he intended to do this weekend, and the answer, of course, did not include the cabin. Worse, the cabin was isolated from all 21st century modes of communication. Laura was so confused that she let her daughter make the call without further question. Chapter 2 Laura's husband has just cooked a barbecue dinner for his three children at the cottage. They are begging him to take them camping with him to get wallabies for their favorite campfire stew tomorrow. Sarah senses her father has been distracted since she arrived, but doesn't press him. They sit down for a family meeting. Sarah started the conversation. Is it because of mom, dad? Yeah, she's been acting weird for months now. Some kind of emotionally withdrawn. And yesterday and this morning I learned some funny things. The sense of horror that gripped the room was only compounded by the father's sigh that completed the statement. They knew him as a strong but jovial man who was rarely serious. They waited. Your mom told me she's going on a two-week course overseas for work. All three children responded that that's exactly what she told them. Yesterday afternoon, she asked me to pick her up from work, so I did. Standing in the waiting room, I saw through the office glass that she was talking to a man in his office. Something about the way they were standing or looking at each other didn't seem right. She didn't come out for more than five minutes, and I wandered around the reception area. There's a wall hung with pictures of all the high-ranking people in the company. I recognized the guy she was talking to. His name is Peter Auer. I picked up his business card at the front desk. This morning I just couldn't sleep, so I went downstairs. I'm a little embarrassed to admit it, but I looked in your mother's purse. In it I found her passport, and upon looking through it, I discovered a visa stamp for Indonesia dated three weeks ago. I remembered seeing her reading a brochure about Bali last month. Their father paused and looked around the room, clearly contemplating what to say. Bali is in Indonesia and is not interstate, it is overseas. I didn't say anything to your mother. It's very serious to accuse someone of cheating without proof, especially someone you love unconditionally. Sarah intervened. We know, Dad. We were raised on your and Mom's values, remember? Never cheat, never lie, always treat everyone with respect until they lose that respect, and then just quietly walk away. Yes. That's why what happened this morning is so hard to understand, let alone talk about. The gloomy atmosphere in the room intensified. They gave my father as much time as he needed to gather his thoughts and decide what to say and how to say it. This morning, your mom asked me to just drop her off at the domestic terminal and leave. She said she was nervous about leaving you home alone for too long. Purely deliberately, I agreed and drove straight to the international terminal. I waited there near the check-in for flights to Bali and saw Mr. Peter Auer checking in. I hid and kept watching. Fifteen minutes later, your mother showed up and checked in as well. I was too stunned to confront her. Do you think? Yes, Sarah, I think your mother lied to me to us, actually, and went to Bali to have an affair with someone she works with. The father turned away, but it was obvious to all three of his children that he was in great pain. They had never seen the great man cry, and they were willing to pay almost anything they had just to avoid seeing his obvious pain now. One by one, starting with Daniel, they enclosed their father in an embrace. Sarah took the lead again. What are you going to do, Daddy? I just don't know, kids. I know that if she ever sleeps with another man, we're finished. Fidelity is the cornerstone of marriage, and any breach is unforgivable. If she hasn't and isn't sleeping with him, I still don't know if I can survive her cheating. So all I have done so far is send them both a message that if they touch each other, there will be trouble. 
That way, I can put off deciding what to do until I have a chance to make a decision. Does that make sense? Sarah nodded to everyone and then told him something he didn't know. Mom left her phone at home, Dad. She wouldn't have gotten your message. I know how to get in touch with her. Do you want me to tell her to leave that creep alone? No, Sarah. I want her to answer for her own reasons. A decision made because of fear of the consequences is no decision at all. She has to have the right motivation. What number did she give you to contact her? Sarah pulled out her phone and opened the long letter from Laura. She read the first six digits to her father, and he read the last four to her from a business card he pulled from his pocket. By this simple act, all four people in the room were convinced of the absolute veracity of his story. There was silence. That's not all, Daddy. Mom asked me to get a letter for you from under the pillow at home. She reached into her bag, pulled out the offending letter, and held it out to him. Everyone waited for him to read it. He objected to reading it aloud once he knew what it said. Young Larry broke the impasse. Dad, this letter is about our family. We have always made all the important decisions as a family. You have to tell us about it. Dave looked at his youngest son and realized he had never felt so proud. Here he was with his siblings at the center of the greatest crisis their family had ever faced, and he was handling it better than his own father. They were all coping. They hugged again, and then Dave started reading. He reread it three times, the second two times emphasizing the third paragraph. Without the third paragraph, it was a perfectly legitimate request from a wife to her husband, and, if taken at face value, a perfectly mature proposal. However, one sentence in the third paragraph mocked the entire message. I'm going away for two weeks with a friend from work. I have never been unfaithful to you, and without your full blessing, I never will be. One proven lie made the rest of the message suspect or just plain wrong. An hour-long mature argument resulted in their mother and wife evaluating motives that were remarkably close to the truth. When other solutions were discarded, an obvious conclusion was reached and a course of action was determined. Depending on the answer to one question, their mother probably no longer deserved to be a member of their family. Dave did his best to stand up for the absent party. Listen, children. If a crime was committed, it was against me as your mom's husband. You mustn't let it affect the way you feel about her. Once again, little Larry answered for everyone. No, Dad. The moment she lied to all of us, she kicked herself out. Dave looked intently at his son. When he saw the protruding chin and serious eyes, he realized that the acorn had fallen not far from the tree. Chapter 3 Laura stunned Pete at the hotel reception desk by asking for a private room on another floor. She had booked it for two days, with an option to extend and a request for a right of first refusal if the room was completely full. Pete checked into the hotel and looked questioningly at Laura. He was told to think about it, go to his room, unpack and meet her in the lobby in two hours. He embarrassedly complied. They met at the appointed time. Peter didn't waste time thinking about it, but when he saw what Laura was wearing, he decided he wouldn't mind jumping on her bones. They'd been close for a month, but other than kissing and groping, nothing had happened. What's wrong, Laura? Think about it, Peter. We arranged to come here together. You get a message on your phone addressed to you by name, telling you that if you lay a finger on this woman, you will regret it for the rest of your life. This message came shortly after a man who looks like my husband made a threatening gesture in your direction. Are you with me? We drove here and my daughter informed me that my husband has been acting completely different than usual. For the last three hours, my husband has not returned my calls, which again is not in his nature. Pete wasn't stupid. He understood what all this could mean, but he didn't see or care what it had to do with him. I think there's an 80% chance my husband knows we're here together. Don't ask me how he found out, I have no idea. I'm 100% sure that if he finds out we slept together, my marriage will be over. That's a price I don't want to pay. If I was 100% sure he knew, I would be on an airplane home by now. If I did, and he doesn't know, how the hell am I going to explain coming back so soon without telling an outright lie? We've been together 25 years. He'll recognize a lie in a second if he's on guard. I'm sorry, Peter, but we're not sleeping together until I get my husband on the phone and convince myself he doesn't know anything. Peter looked visibly disappointed by this statement. Laura realized that he was going to argue about it, so she waved him away. Peter, if you were my husband and you suspected that I had gone on a date with another man, how would you act? 
Easy, I'd hire a private investigator and get proof. Laura watched logic break through the filters of lust in his head. She was still annoyed that the seriousness of her situation didn't penetrate his thick skull. Did you try calling your wife again after you arrived? It caught his attention. Peter immediately looked around the dark corners of the hall, trying to see the camera. Okay, now you get it. Tonight and tomorrow I will sleep alone in my room. When my husband gets back from scrubbing and is able to call me, we'll work it out. In the meantime, don't come to my room, don't come near me unless it's a public place, and don't touch me. If my husband calls, do not answer or put the phone to voicemail. Find me as fast as you can. These are the numbers he'll be calling from. Now give me a friendly kiss on the cheek and we'll go our separate ways. Peter did as instructed, and then they both retreated to their rooms, looking around for surveillance. If either of them had bothered to look at the phone number that Pete's threat had come from, they would have realized that Laura was 80% already a 100% victim. She just didn't know it yet. Chapter 4 Four days had passed, and the long-awaited trip had not gone according to plan. They had to eat in the hotel restaurant and avoid all physical contact. Laura dragged Peter, protesting, to numerous clothing stores for outfits, and they even went on a day trip together on Tuesday. If they were being followed, it was by professionals. Laura insisted that they spend all their days together in case Dave called. On Monday, Laura bought a discarded cell phone and had Pete practice switching to it in case he got a call. Her stress level only went up a little. The school vacation had arrived, and it was possible that Dave had taken Danielle and Larry to the cottage for more than one weekend. However, Sarah not answering emails was a serious concern. Peter held out until Tuesday evening. He retired early, booked an extra room, got out of his room, made sure no one was following him, and had sex all night with one of the imported Javanese prostitutes. On Wednesday, Laura was so concerned that she stayed in her room all day and did some research on the internet. Research about divorce. Then she emailed her in-home attorney and asked him to confirm her assumptions about the outcome of a hypothetical divorce. She used him to handle all of the family's personal legal matters. She handled all such matters for the family. He responded that while it was not his expertise, he believed her assumptions were correct. Three times a day, Dave and Sarah made phone calls and went unanswered. The 80% level began to approach 90%. Cut off emotionally from everyone she knew, she felt as lonely as she had ever felt in her life. She sent Sarah an email begging her to contact her. Dave didn't use email. With no response by Friday, Laura decided to secure her future. She asked her lawyer, who had all the necessary authorizations, to lock up the family finances. She transferred ownership of the only remaining vacant piece of land to a trust, with Sarah and herself as trustees. Any of the signatories could access the trust. She transferred the bulk of the family finances into two separate trusts in the names of their minor children. Again, there were two trustees, but this time both signatures were required. The child in question and another. She wanted the second one to be herself, of course, but the attorney persuaded her to make him the child's legal guardian. It would be more secure that way, he assured her. Of course, the child's signature was useless until he turned 18. Assured that if the worst happened, she'd have control of the purse strings, and if it all turned out to be a storm in a teacup, she could undo the changes. Laura slept better than she had all week. On Saturday, within an hour of each other, two bombshells arrived. The first came with Pete, who came to her room against her instructions. Concerned that his wife was unresponsive, he contacted his brother and asked him to come to his house. The brother reported that he had done so. Pete's wife asked him where his brother wanted the divorce papers delivered. She called him at work and found out that he was not away on a business trip, but was on annual leave. Well, that explained how Dave knew about it. Peter immediately flew home to try and deal with the aftermath. Laura immediately contacted her lawyer and had him sign off on all the changes, escorted Pete to the airport, and moved into his vacated room. The second bomb was closer to home and much more destructive. She decided to check the two younger children's Facebook accounts. Nothing had appeared there since she'd left. No clues as to what they had been up to, and no responses to requests to contact her or otherwise acknowledge her existence. This time, there was a new message on Larry's account. It was announcing to all comers that his mother and father were getting a divorce. No! screamed Laura in an empty room, away from her family. What the hell was David doing? Divorce was followed by conversations, arguments, and explanations. Yeah, even sometimes followed by humiliation. 
kids? So she was the main breadwinner in the family and worked hard. It was inevitable when Dave dropped out after high school and kept her in college. Of course, that meant Dave was the primary influence in their kids' lives. But this shit had gone too far. She prayed, offering prayers to any god who might hear her, that she'd get the signs right and stop her and Pete's plans before they came to fruition. If that didn't happen, Dave would soon have an incontrovertible private investigator's report saying nothing had happened. And now that Peter was gone, nothing would. As she cooled down, she began to think rationally. When no one was talking to her, she used her considerable intellect to try to see dispassionately what Dave was seeing. She made some educated guesses. Someone had found out about her trip to Bali. That someone couldn't be Dave. The only evidence of the plan was on their home computer, and Dave was computer illiterate. This someone, probably Peter's wife, had told Dave, perhaps as early as the morning of the flight. All he could know was that she had lied about the destination and was traveling with Peter. Unless... The letter! If Sarah had ignored her instruction not to read the letter? If Sarah had shared its contents with her father? Laura quickly pulled out the letter and read it with her eyes fully open. It took three attempts, each accompanied by a rapid heartbeat. Point one. Simple statement of facts, no questions asked. Point two. Preparation to start twisting the truth, but otherwise facts. Point three. Part truth, part complete lie, and now he could know it. He was a wonderful lover, but she was tired of being in his arms. It was obvious to her, and if he'd seen the letter, it was obvious to him. His private investigator's report would show that having a friend here was inappropriate, and having a male friend her husband knew nothing about was inappropriate. In the cold light of rationality, she realized that if he had sent her this letter with an outright lie, everything else would immediately come under suspicion. Consequently, her assurances of fidelity would be useless. If she went back to the beginning, her saying that he was a wonderful lover would also be under suspicion. Suddenly, she realized what his main problem was. Peter was right. She had called into question Dave's entire belief that he was satisfying her. His ego would be badly wounded. But she hadn't betrayed him. The private investigator's report should confirm that, at least as far as this trip was concerned. Naturally, he could assume she'd started fornicating even before this trip, but Laura already had a plan in place to counter such an opinion. When had the private detective started the surveillance? If the moment they first checked into this hotel, they should have already known that the private room idea was a thing. Hmm, Laura thought, too many unknowns. The fourth paragraph, which had seemed so thoughtful and loving when she'd written it, was now, assuming it was all a lie, just empty garbage. So was the whole letter, if you looked at it in hindsight. It had turned out to be a complete lie. Laura really hoped he hadn't seen it. Conclusion. If he hadn't seen the letter, she had some pretty fancy work to do. If he had, she suspected no amount of subterfuge would do any good. The irony of the situation almost brought a smile to her face. Her only savior at the moment was the private investigator's report, proving that nothing had happened in Bali. Laura hoped the private investigator was good, but took comfort in the fact that he was so good that she hadn't noticed him, even knowing of his presence. Laura mentally kicked herself. Why had she done that? It had taken a whole night of thinking under the influence of alcohol. Laura had come to the conclusion that she was the classic wife who had it all, who saw a future different from the past and resented it. A successful wife and high-flying businesswoman who had spent her entire career lying, hiding every possible option and, yes, cheating. A woman approaching menopause who had an itch that needed scratching. And then, relying on her cleverness and her husband's naivety, scratch it without consequence. The new irony didn't make her smile. Laura realized that she could soon be a successful businesswoman and a divorced woman who still hadn't scratched that damned itch. The next morning, with no chance of getting any answers to her questions here, Laura decided to go home as soon as possible. First, she decided to use her negotiation skills to delay the irreversible steps of her protagonist. She wrote a letter to David through Sarah. Laura made the letter vague because she didn't know if Sarah had shown the letter to her father or if she had even read it. Her plan was to try to get out of the divorce situation, but to count on the fact that she would be on the winning side if the worst happened. Since she was the kind of person who had foreseen everything, she found counselors in her town and made an appointment online with the one she chose. Then she dressed for the day tour she had booked four days ago. She would still have time to call the airline. Chapter 5 Sarah walks into her father's house and overhears the end of a conversation between her father and his neighbor. 
So besides telling this guy Peter's wife about your suspicions, what else did you do, Dave? Nothing. Hi, Sarah. You know John Smith from next door, right? He's a lawyer, too. He's kindly agreed to give me some advice. Oh, come on, Dave. After all the landscaping advice and help you've given me over the years, not to mention all the tools you've lent me, this is the least I can do. Hi, Sarah. Hey, John. Are you here to help Daddy with his divorce? Well, well, who's talking about divorce? All we know for sure so far is that your mother lied to us and is spending two weeks in Bali with someone. I, for one, will wait to see what she has to say before I make a decision about the divorce. Please forgive my absent-minded father, John. He can be very naive at times. Yesterday, Mom's lawyer called me in to sign a trust agreement that effectively takes away Dad's control of some of the family assets. Then we check all the bank and investment accounts and find that most of it has disappeared somewhere. She's doing everything she can to get you off the hook, Dad. Admit it. And now this finally reveals her true colors. Sarah handed her father two pages of the printed letter. He read them and then handed them to John. Dear Sarah, Would you please print out the attached document and give it to your father? Again, I'm relying on your discretion not to read it. It concerns personal matters between him and myself. Dear David, I suppose you have already realized that I lied to you about the purpose and destination of my trip this week. When I get back, we'll talk about it, and hopefully you'll listen to my apology for the huge mistake I made with the same patience you've always shown. Just know two things and please don't do anything until we talk. 1. I love you and only you, always have and always will. 2. Ever since we became exclusive all these years, I've been faithful to you. I've never once had sex with anyone but you. I admit that my actions of late have given you ample reason to doubt this, and I am willing to do whatever is necessary to convince you of this basic fact. I suggest you give me a lie detector test when I return, hopefully in the next day or so. I am quite willing to stop and take it on the way home from the airport if you can arrange it that way. You will provide questions and ask whatever you want. After this elephant is out of the room, I can apologize for any disrespect you feel I have shown you. Please, please, please don't do anything rash. We both know what a divorce will do. You'll lose the house you've put your heart into and half the money we plan to use for early retirement. Think about the children. Divorce always polarizes families, and if you ask around, the mother always gets custody. Having Sarah and Danielle on my side is a given. It would be tragic if divorce drove a wedge between them and Larry. I know you love the kids, and we both realize that not being able to see them whenever you want would kill you. So please don't do anything until you've given me a chance to explain. See you soon. Your loving wife, Laura. John finished reading the letter. If it wasn't for what we know she was doing behind the scenes, it would have been really compelling, emotional material. What do you mean, John? Dave, you have to realize that in my work, I see all sorts of tricks. This one is pretty common. Your wife decides she wants out of the marriage. She looks for a replacement, finds one, and decides to, uh, take her for a test drive during a two-week vacation. I think it's called an affair on the road. Normally, if she decided he was the one, she'd come back and quietly move all the assets out of your reach and then file for divorce. The really smart people poison the relationship between innocent parents and their children first, like Laura started doing with Sarah. Writing a letter portraying you as a wimp that Sarah was allowed to find is one of the most subtle things I've ever seen. The best way to win in a divorce is to deal your partner a complete blow, limit their access to good advice, that is, leave you penniless, and then make your children choose who to go with. In this case, the choice will be between a mother's welfare in the family home and a broke father living in the slums. Surely there must be another explanation. I can prove it. Contact three of the best divorce attorneys in town. The one or ones who refuse to take your case are already representing her. I bet she gave all three of them an upfront fee to keep you out of the case. If you go broke and get a better lawyer, this bluff has a better chance of working. What's the bluff? This whole letter is a bluff, Dave. Her lawyer must have already told her that getting custody of kids as old as yours isn't as easy as it used to be, especially since you have a good chance of being considered the primary caregiver. Dave, the purpose of this letter is simple. She wants you to stop doing anything while she finalizes preparations for the ambush. Her problem is that you found out about her plan before it was fully worked out. 
When her plan is finalized, she will want the divorce finalized as soon as possible, certainly before Larry turns 14 and can decide which house he wants to live in. You can expect her to force you to see a counselor. In this country, the courts will only grant a divorce if you have lived apart for 12 months or if a counselor says the marriage is irretrievable. Expect her to pick a counselor and intimidate you. Threats at the end are common for women to instigate divorce these days. Dave excused himself by asking John who the best divorce lawyer in the area was. Dave called, gave his name, and asked for an appointment. He was told they could not accept his case. Dave didn't realize that the best divorce attorney in town had a lot of cases, and he told his secretary not to accept any new ones yet. Dave went back to the break room. All right, John, I believe you. What do I do now? First, you authorize me to block all finances not already in Laura's possession. Then you restrict her ability to spend any other shared finances. How do I do that? Well, start by canceling all credit cards and joint names. Okay, but I'm still a little uncomfortable. I mean, she's so convincing that she still loves me. But it doesn't really fit with the threats in the second half of the letter. Dad, are you sure Mom lied to you? Yes, yes, Sarah. Do you lie to those you love, Daddy? No, I don't. What did you always tell us about the three pillars of a successful partnership, Dad? Love, trust, and respect, didn't you? How many of those do you have left? Uh, one, now that you mention it. And just how much is Mother showing you now? No. Ta-da! Chapter 6 When Laura went to pay a fine for changing her flight date, her two credit cards were declined. She rushed to an ATM she had used before. It was refused. She went into emergency planning mode. Hotel and meals had been paid for in advance, so she wouldn't starve to death or be thrown out on the street. She had a few hundred in traveler's checks just in case, but it wouldn't be enough. Since there were no friends at home to borrow money from, the only ones left were her parents. Asking them to wire her money would lead to questions she didn't want to answer at the moment. She quickly sent an email to her lawyer asking what was going on with the bank accounts and then plunged into a boring, no-spending week before her scheduled departure. She wondered how her simple and foolproof plan to scratch an itch could so quickly lead to Dave facing ruin. She knew he would never forgive her infidelity and had knowingly taken the risk, knowing the chances of being caught were astronomical. What could have motivated him to take such drastic action? He suspected that she'd had a fling with another man and already knew that he'd left and nothing had happened. He had no way of knowing about her financial maneuvers. He didn't even know who their financial attorney was. He had always trusted her to take care of such things. While she was quietly banging her head on the table in her room, two emails arrived that didn't improve her mood. The first was from Pete's wife, Riley thanking her for ruining her marriage and jeopardizing her children's secure future. It might have hurt her badly if the second hadn't come while she was processing the first. At first, it seemed to be one of her own letters to Peter from two weeks ago, looking forward to her trip. His and her addresses were listed in the address line, so the letter was forwarded to herself. A simple question was added to the letter, Why did you lie to us, Mom? The letter was signed, Danielle. Her husband may have been computer illiterate, but her children were not. She realized for the first time that Dave wasn't the only victim of her deception or the only participant in her punishment. She also realized that the letter didn't answer that simple question. It also presented Sarah's unresponsiveness in a different light. Laura cried with loss and disappointment. She then sent a letter to Danielle that basically said she would explain the misunderstanding when she got home. Her daughter must have been expecting this because the reply came immediately. It's strange that you chose to spend our school vacation with another man rather than with Daddy and us. Laura cried again. It was an extremely busy and boring week. On a tight budget, there was nothing to do but lie on the beach. She packed a towel. After an hour, she left the beach and returned to the hotel. She realized that coming home with a great tan was tantamount to proving everyone a liar. Frustrated, she sent a long letter home through Sarah. Without going into detail, it spoke of errors in judgment on her part, of being taken for granted as a wife, mother, and primary breadwinner. It even talked about her sense of self-worth in a that's-my-excuse style. It mentioned twice that she had never slept with anyone but Dave during the marriage. The letter again urged her not to do anything rash until she had a chance to talk. There was nothing like an apology in the letter. 
It was not the style of a strong businesswoman who knew she was in an advantageous position. She hit the send button and sat down to wait. Chapter 7 Okay, kids, it's time to have a serious discussion about what we're going to do when your mom gets home. I'm a little surprised that she's decided to stay there, and unless we hear anything different, we'll have to assume she'll be back on Friday as planned. How are we going to play this? Remember, all we know is that she planned to leave with a guy from her job. We don't know anything about whether this is the first time she's lied to us. You first, Sarah. Well, all I had to do was read her latest letter, Dad. It shows that she's just an entitled bitch who treats us like a minor inconvenience to be sidestepped. The fact that she cheated us the first time is, in my opinion, irrelevant. She had a choice. Take her annual vacation and spend it with her family or use it to disappear with someone else. She already spends little time with Danielle and Larry given her long work hours and business trips. I think her behavior before and after she was found out is just disrespectful to all of us and dishonest. If she doesn't change her attitude about what is going on, I will be done with her. Good, Sarah. Harsh but fair. What about you, Danielle? I think she just doesn't understand, Daddy. I agree, honey. When we hear from Larry, I'll explain what I'm thinking of doing. Larry? I don't care, Dad. As long as I stay with you. I'll do everything in my power to make it happen, son. Tell us about your idea, Dad. Well, I think for some reason your mother went off the rails for a while, I don't know. The promotion last year seems to have caused a change. Kids, I hope you'll back me up. I think if she admits what she did and is truly remorseful, we should give her another chance. What do you say? Sarah looked at her younger siblings and felt agreement. Little kids just need stability until they reach reactionary age, when they discard everything their parents believe in and try to change the world. That's right, Dad. We'll try, but you've seen her last letter. I've reread it 16 times and I see no remorse. Strangely enough, I believed her when she wrote that she had never been unfaithful to you. I agree, Sarah. That's why I've planned a little shock for her. Once she experiences it, she will realize that we believe she has already committed a crime against the family. I don't think she realizes how offended we are, which is why she is concentrating on the physical impact. After we get her to understand our feelings, the million-dollar question is what she will do about it. If she breaks down and apologizes to all of us, we'll talk about it. If she doesn't, then we'll see. That's my idea. Chapter 8 The return letter took Laura by surprise. It came from Sarah, but it was addressed to Dave and all three children. It described the timetable for her return. After reading it, a sense of foreboding gripped her, as if she had failed in her task. She was expected to return late Friday night. The letter said she had an appointment with a polygraph examiner and indicated that all four rebels were taking the questions. After the test, she was put up in a motel for two nights so she could mull over her answer. Anytime after noon on Saturday, she could request a meeting to discuss the family's future. Laura resented being ordered around, but for now she decided to play along with their little game. One thing was certain. As soon as she ate her humble pie, she would be in for a serious beating. People needed to know who was boss. Relieved, she relaxed a little. She was glad that her offer of a lie detector had been accepted. It was the surest way to convince Dave that she had kept her vow. She knew that if she could convince Dave, the rest would fall into place. What questions would he ask? He knew her behavior in Bali. That was a given. The main question he would ask would be, had she done anything with Pete before Bali? If he asked the direct question, have you had sex with Peter or anyone else other than your husband? She would be at home. She feared he might ask more insidious questions, such as, have you always behaved in a manner befitting a wife? and then she would be on shakier ground. She hadn't had sex with Peter in the strict Bill Clinton-like sense of the word. Then there was Michael, before Pete. They hadn't had sex either, but only because Mike had chickened out at the last minute. Laura realized it was a mistake to anticipate the questions too much. She knew that polygraphs relied on indicators such as heart rate and sweating. By taking the questions at face value, she risked raising her stress level and causing a false positive reaction. However, she practiced answering her simple-minded husband's implied questions anyway. Generally relaxed, she went to the airport at the appointed time. She had deliberately not told anyone what time her flight was arriving. Under the pretext that everyone would be busy with work or school, she insisted on a cab. The family couldn't be in the domestic terminal when she arrived at the international terminal, right? 
Coming out of customs, she couldn't help but compare the way she had arrived to the way she had envisioned it. Instead of purring like a contented kitten, she arrived with a begging bowl in her hands. After the cab ride, she sat in the polygraph waiting room for an hour until one of the technicians led her into the room. He outlined the basic procedure for the pre-test questions to calibrate the equipment to her physiology. Then the technician pulled out a folder and frowned. Oh, right. That's the one. Laura blushed slightly. Knowing the nature of the questions, she realized that the operator would soon guess her recent history. Mrs. Brown, the questions I have 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 a rather unusual format. Instead of the usual list of questions, they are in the form of a flowchart. Eh? Yeah, I've seen that once or twice before. There's an initial question, and then depending on the answer to that question, a choice of what to ask next. It slows things down a bit, but it doesn't affect the validity of the tests, I assure you. Are you ready? Ready as I've always been. The operator went over the eight calibration questions, then paused to open the file again and read. Question 9. Two weeks ago you went to Bali with the intention of having extramarital sex with Mr. Peter Ower? Yes. The operator looked at the polygraph readings and made a note. Then he looked at the file. Laura was not surprised by the question. She braced herself for the next one. Would it be a question about whether she had actually had sex with Pete in Bali, or a question about whether she had had sex with Pete before going to Bali? She hoped like hell that the question would be asked in a form that she could plausibly deny. To the simple question, did you have sex with Peter Ower, she could answer no and walk on by. Please keep it simple. The technician closed the file and began taking the paper out of the machine. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. I have an email address to send the report to. You may go. To say Laura was stunned is a vast understatement. What the hell does that mean? What, just one question? Yeah, an unusual one. I've only seen this once before, and I know that guy was trying to get his point across. I think whoever wrote those questions was, too. Your husband? Laura nodded automatically. What did he mean by that? Because I don't understand. I assume your husband means to say that he doesn't care at all if you had an affair in Bali. He just wants to confirm that you intended to do it. He's saying loud and clear that your intention to have sex with this guy from Peter is enough for him. Good luck, Mrs. Brown. There are business cards for a couple of good divorce lawyers on the reception desk. Laura left the room in a daze. She had based her entire defense, her entire learning process, on convincing her husband that she had not slept with anyone else. Lacking professional merit, she had no idea how offended he was by her dishonesty and simple intentions. Frustrated and angry, Laura made her final mistake. Ignoring the opportunity to go somewhere else to allow time to make a rational decision, she jumped into a cab and drove home. In her opinion, it was now a true battle of wills. The competitive instinct kicked in. Dave had fired the first shell, and now it was her turn to return fire. The cab dropped her off at the entrance to her neighborhood. Sitting in the car on the opposite side of the street, Dave, Daniel, and Larry looked sadly at each other as they watched the furious woman head toward the former family home. They were grateful that they had made all the provisions last night. The last thing Dave wanted was to be abused in front of the kids. It would definitely be bad for their health. They made it to the room they had booked for Laura, checking to make sure their phones were turned off. Chapter 9 There was no word from Laura until Monday. The hope that she had used the time to think rationally was faint, but it was there nonetheless. The last hope collapsed when, late Monday night, Dave received a letter from Sarah. It censured him for his low tactics of sicking the children on her. It spoke of an emergency family court hearing her attorney was organizing to decide temporary custody of Danielle and Larry. Playing on John's predictions, it also informed her that she had set up an appointment for them to meet with a psychologist the next day. It called for a family meeting on Wednesday night. Laura pondered over the weekend and, as usual, came up with a plan that she felt covered all the bases. The first thing was to try to save the marriage that Dave seemed to have written off. That meant seeing a counselor. A female one, of course, to maximize the chances of her explaining her train of thought to her husband. Second, family sessions to explain her actions to the children. Third, of course, court to make sure she will be on the winning side if the worst happens. Laura was already in the counselor's room when Dave arrived just in time for Tuesday. He immediately liked the woman in her 40s, dressed like a 60s woman. Chairs were arranged facing the counselor, but more than an arm's length apart. After introductions, 
during which Laura was Laura and Dave was Mr. Brown, the aging hippie invited Laura to go first. Laura explained the history of their marriage and then laid out the facts as she saw them. She was a faithful wife and mother until for some reason she went off the rails, lied to her family, and had a date with another man. There was no sex as her husband's observation of her showed, but the intent was there. While leaving, she was stunned to learn that her credit cards had been canceled. She regretted what she had done, and her most sincere wish was to simply put the episode behind her and move on with her marriage to David. The counselor looked at Dave. Firstly, I would like to say that I am speaking on behalf of myself and our children. My children's main complaint is that their mother lied to them, used two weeks of her annual vacation, which is six months, to go off on her own, and left her phone number so that she could not be contacted in case of an emergency. In all honesty, I did not commission any surveillance of Laura in Bali. This stunned Laura. Since it was the first thing she would do, she couldn't believe it was true. In fact, I didn't even want to believe she was playing on the side until our youngest daughter hacked into Laura's email account and discovered traces of the arrangements she and her lover had left behind. Also, for the record, I was advised to cancel my credit cards after my oldest daughter discovered that my wife was engaged in blocking all the family finances in such a way that I was left helpless. Once again, Laura was stunned. She hadn't realized that her precautions had been exposed, nor had she thought about how such actions would be interpreted. The fact that both her daughters were actively working against her didn't improve her mood either. As for what my wife wants out of this process, pardon me for not trusting a damn word she says anymore. The fury of his words finally conveyed to Laura how offended her husband was by her action. Before she could react, the counselor turned to Dave. So what do you hope to accomplish with these classes? I hope to understand why my wife thought it was acceptable to lie to her family and arrange to have sex with another man. At this point, David and Laura's marriage could still be repaired. Everything changed in an instant. The change was not the fault of the husband or wife, but of the counselor when she muttered almost under her breath. Oh, we have a dinosaur. Dave, who thought that Laura had set the whole thing up to hasten the divorce and had purposely chosen a counselor to minimize the chances of reconciliation, snapped. He had heard of such counselors and thought it was just wrong. He stormed out of the room. Laura, who had a slim chance of avoiding disaster if she had run after Dave and apologized to him, took out her frustration on the counselor. By the time she finished the beating, Dave was long gone. The counselor apologized and persuaded Laura to have an individual session with her the following week. She then apologized to David for her inappropriate behavior and had an individual session with him as well. This was the third mandatory session, at the end of which a decision was to be made as to whether to continue or abandon the work. Chapter 10 The family meeting the next day didn't go any better for Laura. She just didn't get it. Once you lie to someone, Trust becomes a footnote in the history books, just above the tusk of a woolly mammoth. She invited them all over for dinner before the meeting, but Sarah reminded her that she couldn't cook worth a damn and told her they would all be in at 7.30 p.m. Laura tried to hug them all as they walked in, but they all treated her very coldly. Laura made the mistake of sitting down last. By the time she was ready, she found herself alone in front of four stairs from the couch. She tried to get her best friend Sarah to move to her side, but to no avail. Once again disappointed, she began her prepared speech. There was little apologizing and a lot of, I didn't really do anything, and excuses. She felt unappreciated both as a woman and as the main breadwinner in the family. Her husband's attention became a matter of course, and she began to miss the attention that single women took for granted. She began to feel unageably attractive. When a younger man began to pay attention to her, she succumbed to his charms. During the conversation, Laura tried to focus on Daniel and Larry. She found it difficult to meet Dave's gaze, and Sarah was making notes in her notebook behind her raised knees rather irritably. Finally, the silence of those she had come to refer to as the opposition bench silenced her as well. Sarah spoke up. Damn, Mom, you've disappointed me again. What? Why? On the cliché test, I can only give you 85%. If you had mentioned that no one would be hurt if they didn't find out, I could have given you 100%. No one knew if Laura blushed from anger or because she realized she had meant to say it too, but it slipped her mind. Whatever the reason, she realized she wouldn't get any sympathy from her children as long as Dave controlled their hearts and minds. David, to the kitchen now, please. 
Laura pounced on him as soon as they were alone behind the closed door. She hissed at him through clenched teeth. Does it really have to be this way, David? I break you until you come crawling back begging me for forgiveness. Dave looked at her sadly because he realized that she remained a slave to her own nature. No, it doesn't have to be that way at all. If you just did what you should know is a decent thing to do, the outcome doesn't have to be inevitable. If you drop the stupid bitch you've chosen to be your impartial counselor, and we go to... I'll see you in court, David. Chapter 11 On Thursday, Dave moved into a rented three-bedroom house. Obviously, none of this is going to end anytime soon. He was also notified that the preliminary custody hearing for Danielle and Larry was scheduled for the following Tuesday. After learning the name of the family court judge assigned to him, he called John. John told him that he had gotten lucky and had picked the same judge who had never given custody to his father. Dave declined John's offer to represent him, but asked for a weekend appointment to learn about the procedures and what he could and couldn't say. He was going to try to use the system properly once and then go back to his own tactics. He was doing what he had to do to ensure the emotional well-being of his children. A fun weekend was spent fixing up the rental house. Dave sat the kids around the table and honestly explained what the house would look like in the near future and what his long-term plans were. The kids perked up and joined in the planning. Together, they searched the internet for everything they needed. On Tuesday, Laura's attorney was a little shocked to learn that Dave intended to represent himself. He realized the awkward position Laura would be in if she was questioned by her own husband. The court was late that day, so only administrative matters could be discussed until the end of the session, and then everyone was required to appear the next day. Overnight, the news reached several local reporters in this leisurely newsweek. The next day began with Laura's attorney going over property ownership, relative earning power, and other details. Dave then began asking questions. Laura was visibly nervous, which did not go unnoticed by the reporters. He began gently. I'm the one who built the family home with my own hands? Yes, you did, but I was busy working and earning most of the money. Did you return to work within two months of the birth of all your children? Yes. Who used to make our children's breakfasts, school lunches, and dinners? You, I worked long hours. Would you say I was the primary caregiver? Probably. You recently lied to me and your children and went to Bali for two weeks for the express purpose of having sex with another man? Objection, Your Honor. Someone needs to tell Mr. Brown that adultery is no longer a factor in child custody disputes in this country. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I don't care about adultery. I just want to emphasize the character of my wife, who considers herself a fit mother. Objection overruled. Well? I went to Bali because I needed a vacation, and it just so happened that I went with a male friend from work, yes. When you left for Bali after lying to your family, did you leave the following letter for your husband to find? Then Dave read the letter in full. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw both reporters strobing furiously. Laura didn't have to answer the question. Her furious stare did it for her. It was embarrassing. Is it true that when you returned from your dastardly journey, you never once attempted to apologize to your husband and family for your deception and obviously immoral intentions? Again, the stern answer was silence. Your Honor, your decision seems like it would be an easy one. I am the primary caretaker of my minor children and always have been. They should be awarded to me along with the house I built and in which they have lived most of their lives. I have never cheated on my wife or told her and the children any blatant, damaging lies, and I demand that she retract this. She has shown by her actions that she cannot influence my children. Dave took his seat with his back to Laura. Her angry eyes tried to burn holes in the back of his head. The judge was fully awake and made her ruling immediately. The gist of it boiled down to the fact that countless studies had shown that in the event of a divorce, the children were always better off living with their mother. According to her decision, temporary custody and living in the family home would go to Laura. Laura smiled smugly. Dave remained neutral. This was exactly what he had expected after his conversation with John. He stood up. Your Honor, let me address the court. I would like to call attention to your own decisions in Harper v. Harper, Smith v. Smith, Fulton v. Fulton, and others too numerous to mention, where you awarded custody to the primary caregiver. Receiving no response from the judge, 
Dave proceeded to cite three scientific papers refuting the notion that children are always better off with their mother. What are you getting at, Mr. Brown? I was just wondering, Your Honor, can a man with a penis win in your court? The judge looked intently at Dave. He stared back dumbfounded. Then she declared the case closed and scheduled the next one. The reporters were frantically writing. Dave walked over and gave them copies of Laura's letter. Then he walked out without looking back. Laura's lawyer walked over and congratulated her. She didn't feel like celebrating. Dave's speech about how she was not remorseful in the slightest for her actions had struck a nerve. Unfortunately, her reflex to win any fight wouldn't let her back down once the game was up. Blaming his marriage on Laura's smug smile, Dave counted all the people who had offended his sense of justice and needed to be re-educated. There were three of them, and the plans were already in place. He had already consulted with Sarah to get a second opinion and made the changes she suggested. In fact, one of her suggestions was much better than what he had envisioned. He returned home and, through a friend in the federal government, delivered a letter to the president of the federal court outlining his accusations of bias against one judge. He then waited for Danielle and Larry to return from school. They readily agreed to his request to spend at least the next two nights with their mother. He then handed them the equipment for the second phase of his plan. Two newspaper articles published the next day spoke unflatteringly of both Laura and the judge. Dave cut them out and emailed them to a friend of a friend of a friend. Chapter 12 Wednesday afternoon, Laura thankfully made it home on time. Daniel and Larry were there, but made it clear that this was done in protest. When they deigned to answer her questions, they limited themselves to the bare minimum of words. She had to ask them to make the school lunches for the next day. It had been so long since she had done that, it had slipped her mind. Not finding anything suitable in the cupboards, she ended up giving them money for the canteen. She got home at 4 p.m. to change for her 5 p.m. solo counseling session. At the session, she laid out her conditions for taking Dave back. This took half the session. The counselor spent the rest of the time going over the history of their marriage. Laura confessed to two inappropriate liaisons before Peter, one with a work colleague and the other with a neighbor. She emphasized that with all three friends, there was no actual sexual intercourse, failing to mention that in the first two cases, it was not by her choice. She expressed genuine bewilderment as to why Dave was so offended by her actions since nothing had happened. The counselor promised to check with her husband about the terms, but warned that reconciliation was unlikely, given that Dave's objections seemed to be based on dishonesty and intentions rather than actions. The session with Dave the next day was short, abrupt, and a little intimidating. When asked what he wanted out of the session, Dave simply gave her a choice of two options. Either he wanted a referral to another counselor who wouldn't openly condone female infidelity, or he wanted her to sign off that the marriage was irretrievable. A little alarmed that her statement from the first session might hurt her career, the counselor quickly reported to the proper authorities that the marriage was dissolved. She knew that another report about her to her professional body might well be her last. When Dave got home, Danielle and Larry were already there and looked quite settled. A police officer knocked on the door and said he was violating a family court order. He pointed out that it wasn't him, but his children. The only way to evict them was by force, and that would be considered assault. The policeman asked the children to come with him, but they refused. He left to get instructions. No sooner had he returned than Laura burst into the house. David, I've already told you it doesn't have to be like this. Just tell Danielle and Larry to come with me. Give me the house and I'll be generous with visitation and property division. Laura, please leave my territory. I will not force the children into a situation they don't want and will hurt their sense of right and wrong. David, we've known each other for how long? You know me, I'm not a bad person. That's the problem, Laura. I don't know you. The woman I married wouldn't have done what you did. She certainly wouldn't have done what you did. And then not only would she have had no remorse, but she would have told our counselor to give me an ultimatum. Put up with your behavior or lose everything I hold dear. Certainly not after I found out in counseling yesterday that before Peter, you had tried to have relationships with two other men. Tell me, Laura, what did I do to deserve what you did to me, and what are you going to do now? The realization that the counselor had let her go down the river made Laura blush. Guilt prevented her from taking out her anger on Dave. The bitch counselor was another matter entirely. She was the one on whom all of Laura's anger was now focused. She's not allowed to tell you that. 
Dave did not comment on this statement either explicitly or implicitly. Laura ran away in a rage. Dave went and erased the tape recorder that Daniel had put in Laura's purse before the counseling session and retrieved afterward. He was sure that righteous justice was about to visit the counselor. And he was right. Three days later, the counselor received word that her services were no longer required. One downside, two to go. Children's services arrived on Saturday morning but left disappointed when it became apparent that the children would only leave if they were forcibly dragged outside screaming and kicking. They made the mistake of trying to apply logic to a highly emotional situation, said Chief Officer Larry. The courts have decided it's better for you to live with your mother. So the courts were wrong. Neither Danielle nor I want to live with a liar who hurt our father. That was the end of it. Laura spent the next week trying to get all three children back on her side. Eventually, they refused to return her calls and immediately deleted her emails and phone messages. She tried to talk to Dave, but as soon as he realized the conversation did not include an apology, he ended it. Finally giving up, he hired John as his divorce attorney. He also went to see Sarah's boss to confirm the advice she had given him. At the end of the next week, he found out through Sarah that Laura was going on another business trip for the entire next week. He took a week's vacation and did a phenomenal job helping the children after school and during work hours. Laura found out exactly what the attempt was when she arrived home the following Friday. She pulled into the driveway and marveled. In front of her was a beautifully landscaped lot with a hanging pool. There was a brick garage, too. All that was missing was her beautiful, award-winning home. Her collapsible palace had been dismantled. In its place stood a lone, very damaged building. Apparently, it had been bought at one of the insurance write-off auctions after being damaged in transit. In a daze, she opened the door and realized Dave had made an effort to replace the locks. All of her clothes, some of her furniture, and all of her personal belongings were there. She was torn between rage and deep sadness. For a while, the sadness won out. On the floor, right in front of the door, was a copy of the title deeds. She read, Land and dwellings at address in the address. She realized that she had been cleverly duped. The land belonged to her, and there was indeed a dwelling on it. She called her lawyer to confirm that nothing could be done about the house, and then, after some thought, called her financial advisor to modify the only financial agreement she had made that could be modified at this point. It concerned a trust into which a vacant piece of land had been transferred. She was told that Sarah had already exercised her right and had transferred all the documents into her name only. Laura's last act before she finally lost her mind was to curse her own arrogance when she thought all three children would side with her. Then she realized that the rest of her family had turned against her. Dave for stealing her house. The kids for not supporting her. She was very close to realizing the enormity of her crimes, but unfortunately, self-pity turned to anger again before the connection was fully made. She sent a letter to all three children. Do you really hate me that much? A lonely reply came back. We don't hate you. You always knew I would do whatever was necessary to protect our family. It's just unfortunate that you put me in a position where I have to protect them from you. Signed, Dave. Laura gathered her personal belongings, then went and checked into the motel. She drove there through Sarah's neighborhood to make sure the modules of her old house were neatly lined up, waiting to be placed and plugged in. On Monday, she received Dave's divorce filing at work. He apologized for getting her there, but explained that he didn't know where else she could be. She spent the next hour trying to read between the lines of an agreement that at first glance seemed generous. It gave her 100% ownership of the jointly acquired property, which, given that most of the other assets were locked up, was the vast majority. Several items of expense had to be deducted from the value of the property. These included the cost of airfare and a hotel room in Bali. A note explained that these were the amounts Dave believed Laura had stolen from the marriage. Also deducted were the cost of the divorce and the cost of unraveling her financial fraud, including half of the expected interest on the money put into a trust for the next two and five years respectively. She requested that the children be placed in the custody of whichever parent they chose. For the sake of unity, if Danielle or Larry chose the other parent, Larry, as the youngest, would make the decision. Family unity was paramount. Laura called her financial advisor and asked what the chances were of her revoking the two trusts in the children's names and was told, none. He did his job well. Through a divorce lawyer, she tried to get another counselor appointed. But since the first one had already agreed to the marriage, it was impossible without Dave's consent. 
When she demanded such consent through the attorney, Dave reminded her that he had already suggested another counselor a few weeks earlier and had been turned down. Now that Laura seemed to be guided only by the prospect of her imminent destruction, it was too late. Laura signed the contract, realizing it was the best she would ever get. Since the family court had surely awarded her custody of Danielle and Larry, she would receive the assets pledged in the trusts of the two minor children as their legal guardian. That meant she would lose only the value of the second parcel of land. Once all the I's and T's were dotted, the divorce went quickly. The lawyer assured her that they would be assigned the same family court judge since they were now under her jurisdiction, and she had a reputation for being very biased. The lawyer usually advised his male clients who confronted her to give up and save their money. Knowing that her vengeful plan was on track, that she would win and Dave would be left destitute, Laura relaxed. She wondered if Dave's pride would allow her to crawl back in, in which case she would be magnanimous but with conditions, or if he would resign himself to beggary. Chapter 13 Having regained her confidence, Laura walked into court a month later. She was met by an anxious lawyer. He pointed to a woman in a suit in the front row of the public gallery. You see this woman? I went to law school with her. I hear she works in the office of the chief federal judge now. Something's going on and I don't like it. He was clearly agitated and it infected Laura with nervousness. The judge opened the hearing by announcing that this was her last case as she was taking early retirement. She didn't seem happy about that. Then the lawyers began. Laura objected to Dave's demand that Laura be charged all legal fees. He suggested that Laura pay Dave's costs and vice versa. John disagreed, pointing out that he was acting pro bono for Dave. From that point on, things went downhill. John painted an accurate picture of the couple and their relative merits as guardians. There was little Laura's attorney could do. He seemed to regret trusting the judge's protocol and not preparing much factual evidence. The case lasted all morning and was clearly one-sided. Once again, the judge ruled. Often glancing at the costumed woman in the audience and speaking as if she had a mouthful of broken glass, she said that the facts of the case were simple and that Dave, as primary caregiver, was awarded custody. She even congratulated him on the generous offer he had made to Laura for the division of property and hoped that he could raise the children well on the share he had accepted. There was insincerity in her voice the whole time. Laura was so shocked that she missed the final clang of the judge's gavel. She returned to her lonely one-bedroom apartment and wondered which bus had hit her. She couldn't indulge in self-pity, however. She had a real estate matter to resolve. In anticipation of a financial decision, she put her old house up for sale. It was a steep, uncomfortable neighborhood, suitable only for a very specific house, and the price she had agreed to set for it was very low. Unless someone replicated her old house exactly, even the landscaping would have to be abandoned. It had been spectacular before, but only because of Dave's ingenious design. This afternoon was settlement time. She wanted to hand the title deeds to the new owners herself and wish them to enjoy the house as much as she had. She was disappointed when the man present announced that he was just an agent for the new owners. They would be here soon if she wanted to wait. When Laura saw David's car driving four trucks with her old house and a crane behind them, she decided to leave. At her new place, she looked at the meager check in her hand, all she had gotten from the train wreck she had turned her successful life into. Still slightly dazed, she wrote in her thought journal that a friend had recommended to her to help her cope. She took a red felt tip pen and wrote in big, bold letters. Next time you get an itch, go to a goddamn pharmacy. Next time you mess up, apologize, damn it. You're twice as smart as you think you are. About eight weeks after she was due, Laura left to have some humble pie. She bought a bottle of champagne to congratulate the new homeowners when she arrived. The end. What do you think, dear reader? Perhaps some good advice at the end. I have some more that you can take or leave. When two people invite a third person to solve a problem, whether it's a counselor, a well-meaning lawyer, or the neighborhood guy, they give up control of their own destiny. If possible, solve your own problems yourself and always treat your loved ones with dignity and respect. I don't know if the following saying applies to Australia or not. Be careful of the toes you step on today. They may be holding the ass you'll have to kiss tomorrow. Since the above was not a continuation of an American story, it was written in Australian, or as we call it, strine. For those who don't want to look up unfamiliar terms in an Australian dictionary, I'll tell you that a stream is a stream, and to go to scrub is to leave town.
Australians are an irreverent race who do not automatically respect authority. This fact is often blown out of proportion by our politicians who take themselves too seriously. In fact, some of our most prominent politicians have been some of the biggest larrikins in the past. In the 70s, we had a prime minister called Gao, pronounced Gough Whitlam. During an interview, he was pressured by an aggressive journalist who wanted him to state where he stood on the abortion debate. Like many politicians, Gough wanted to keep his personal views on this highly controversial debate private, but she pressed him. He finally snapped and gave her his opinion during a live interview. Madam, I am in favor of abortion, and in your case, I would make it retrospective. He jumped 20 points in the opinion polls. I apologize for my absence, but I am currently in prison. I love reading stories about heroes of the past, and I recently read a story about a little Dutch boy who saved the day by sticking his finger in a dam. I'll spare you the details, but I was so impressed that I tried to do it myself. With good behavior, I should be out in about six months.